Okay. <sighs> Hello, everyone. First off, I would like to say that in this moment I'm very tired but a unique thought occurred to me or I should say it in another way uh, I saw something today that I felt okay <clears throat> let's voice this I wrote down the sentence titled the identity leans against a single image of a worldview you see when you try to wonder about uh, what the human being is uh, honestly you notice that if it comes to <coughs> physical identification pretty much it's the mystery of matter but when a person wonders about from the dimension of mind from a view of the mind if we were to reverse engineer and see what the human being is we actually are directed towards understanding experientially what awareness is excuse me to continue pretty much my view is that when it comes to the body we wonder about the mysteries of physics when it comes to the mind we wonder about the mysteries of psychology and <clears throat> it's as if if I was to give some sort of hierarchical structure to the significance of various views on reality it would be as if uh, there is physics, then there is chemistry, then there is biology, then there is psychology, then there is philosophy, then there is mysticism. And so this, this spectrum is in some sense a suggestion that after a human being is satisfied with certain physical questions the answers to certain physical questions <clears throat> they move on to in some degree they move on to the questions of psychology when it comes to questions of psychology the framework of how we acknowledge the human being is different that means uh, when you look outside you see other human beings as objects but those human beings are and they and those human beings look at you and see you as an object but in actuality every person is uh, having a relationship with their own self as a subject <clears throat> so that means in front of our eyes game of objects behind our eyes game of subjects 
Now the question comes, where is the object? Or another way of saying that would be, where is the human body? And one answer goes, again, external explanation. You're in a world, cosmos, universe with countless stars and galaxies. <clears throat> but when it comes to an inner response, the body is in the mind. And the mind is a spacious awareness that is being the whole moment. You see, if you identify, imagine there's this glass orb. <clears throat> this is honestly something pointed out by the potential the Yoga Sutras, which I'm using as an example, where the idea was that uh, consciousness is like a glass orb, and whatever color this consciousness goes on, it takes that color, or the, the way I wanted to use the example, that's what Patanjali says, but the way I want, I want to use the example is that imagine there's this, like, you know, crystal glass orb, <clears throat> and so there's content inside, inside it there's stuff, and now your mind is being the whole orb, but your body is the stuff in the orb. You see, we have been conditioned to, to I mean, this is really the <clears throat> fruition of the material explanation of reality, that your mind is in your body. And the reason, of course, this is being said is because if there's anything that happens to the brain, it's as if the film projector has issues. Do you see what I'm saying? It's quality, it's, it's ability changes, right? <clears throat> but if we were to think that the brain is like an antenna, and there is a spherical sort of signal, or a, a, a spherical signal, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know how people are going to visualize that, but imagine, like, the, sp the sphere, the, the glass orb suddenly realizes that's what it is. So to me, all the spiritual, mystical, wise people on this planet, they were identifying as the space where reality is happening, and space cannot die. If you think about identification as a body, sure, the body dies. And a better word for it is that the body changes. It's as if, you know, there's a rent-a-car and there's also rent-a-karma, which is, in some sense, the, the body. And then we got to give it back. Really, that's what it is. It's as if, we, it's as if invisible fields of intelligence are using, you know... <coughs> a planetary system to resurface as fragments of nature so anyways I'm, I'm trying to say that we wonder about where is the object the answer comes it's in a subject it's in the mind now we wonder about where are the subjects and the subjects are in the pure space of awareness there is a distinction made between the word consciousness and awareness which is so supreme and huge like it's so important for people to know <clears throat> because awareness is unconditional consciousness is conditional consciousness is either through something to something or off something or from something <clears throat> but when you look at awareness awareness is kind of like space being alive but the way it's being alive is that it's micro identifying it's like you know, with a ridiculous level of concentration, it's like an invisible a field is moving what's in it, you know. <clears throat> I had a dream recently, and it was, uh, I've had dreams where I've died in them. I think this would be like, I don't know, maybe the fifth one I've had. <clears throat> but there is something that uh, I experienced this dream where the way it was as if my body froze and then it was collapsing and as it was collapsing I just I was there be like watching it happen not in the body you see this is this a, a very incredible thing I think this is the to some degree an ultimate spiritual practice that the person becomes acquainted with how the presence of the moment does not change you see it's as if energy is transforming and the story of human civilizations is arising but it's as if some at some point in this event of life there is an instantaneity of energy with expression that is uh, that is in some sense changeless it's it's as if what I'm saying is that <clears throat> 
the awareness as energy is changeless, the awareness to energy is changing. Now, the statement, let me go here and say this, that the statement, when you remember, you never forgot, means that an intelligence that fragmented itself into dimensions of body, mind, and soul, which is another way of saying the known, the unknown, and a bridging dimension. You see, the mind is kind of like a genie. I mean, that's probably not a good metaphor. But I'll say it's like the mind can instantaneously provide with just the whim of a feeling image. You know, it, it, it's as if when I give these talks, of course, the main theme is about advanced, advancing civilization. But in my inner realms, I have seen ways an advanced civilization takes place that its reality changed my emotions now. <clears throat> so an example would be imagine you're on your balcony and you you know you look at uh, buses on the streets, you know, driving by and for a second your mind begins to fathom. It's as if what if these buses were like, you know, flying between buildings. It's as if somebody is sitting on their balcony, imagine, in the morning having coffee, pleasant moment, and then suddenly, like, a truck passes by and all the exhaust, like... <laughs> moments in life where I would say the mind becomes bored with how matter is mindless. It's remarkable how it's on some level it's just existence here but when existence moves that's where experiential entities claim personalities.
You know, this whole episode is about me building up to my experience of what I feel was there before uh, the earliest image. (coughs) When it comes to the body, the body is like clothing. As the years pass, you know, it's as if you wear different things. When it comes to the mind, a person, you know, here's the strange thing about the mind. If I if I ask myself, where is time? I And I wonder if my mind is in time. I see that, no, my mind is generating time. My mind is the brain. It, it's like an event of the brain. The view of time. Now, if I, if I realize my brain is producing or generating time, the, the notion of time, <clears throat> now the question comes, is it a timeless state or a timeless place uh, or dimension where uh, the brain, uh, it's like before the brain produces time, generates the notion of time, is it timeless there? Now, if we go with the assumption that, yeah, it is, this is the strange thing, that the body experiences change at a certain level. When it comes to the mind and the inner realms, you see the inner realms, it's as if like a person in the outer realms is living in a house. The person in the inner realms is living in another world. It's as if the rooms of the mind are worlds. I th- right now as I'm talking, it's as if like, you know, I acknowledge my bodies in the moment. I notice how and en- like the energy that is being me is just here. It's just present. And I also notice that the, my inner realms, even though we say it's happening in our brain, but my inner realms are as visible as in front of my eyes in a strange way. So it's as if like, imagine there was a screen in another dimension, <coughs> like, uh, a rectangular screen this is just it for example sake imagine there was a rectangular screen in another dimension and every thought you had projected there or think of it maybe in, in, in even a more a differently poetic manner that imagine what they call the third eye is like another projector system do you see in another dimension it's as if think of your imagination <clears throat> as a private art studio where in that art studio there is instantaneous projection of reality and when we be, stop being responsible for our mind that is when in, i would say um, whether you like it or not uh, material like nihilism like a black hole it, it, it pulls materialism into it, you know. There is something that if you just identify as a physical being, you have to uphold levels of bravery for your own mortality. <clears throat> because to, to consider yourself as, as in some sense, it's as if a bunch of uh, particles hallucinating, elemental particles hallucinating personhood, it's as if whether you like it or not, there is a bizarre point. When it, at, at, um, in some sense of how intense reality happens. Now, for myself, throughout the years, and especially these talks helped, but <clears throat> I realized that um, I became com- content with how my body is existing to some degree. This doesn't mean a person doesn't change, but I'm saying that Uh, I found a contentment with physical reality because the input is subjective and my contentment with subjective reality. That means uh, it's as if, as imagine there was someone and um, that uh, had dedicated his attention in trying to reach the core truth of how intelligence is being intelligent. <clears throat> I would say when it comes to my contentment with the inner realms, I have, the contentment comes from not at identifying with your thoughts and watching them. 
You see a lot of people in meditation, they think meditation is to sit down and have no thoughts, you know, and then the person sits down to not have any thoughts and then they notice their thoughts and they're like, man, I have so many thoughts. How can I stop having thoughts? Do you see? And the only answer to that is that you realize the thought of stopping is a thought. Like you realize it's like a, this is the fallacy of civilization 1.0, the current civilization we're in. What people feel they are thoughts, their sense of self is a thought, and then they think that thought is having other thoughts. Do you see this is, this is, this is in some sense, uh, you can say ignorance of the outer realms or the best we have so far. So my contentment with the content of my mind, right now it's at a point where it's as if the same hollowness that I think of it this way, somebody was like, yo, I'm not just a body, you know, and then they had a spiritual identity, okay, a spiritual perspective on their identity. And then imagine a person realizing all stories for the soul are mind content. And then you're left as wondering, it's, it's kind of like a transcendental riddle. What is it that is aware it is a body and aware that it is, a, it is an object and a subject at the same time? And this is the inconceivable. To me, I feel the concept of God, where they say God is inconceivable, was from one end, man's attention trying to connect a personalized archetype to the whole cosmos do you see <clears throat> it's as if like it's like man we live in such a bizarre world that like probably i think if there were extraterrestrials in other dimensions they'd be like oh my god these human beings are hilarious we are like the comedians of the galaxy you know <laughs> <laughs> A type of comedy where we are, uh, how would I say? to share my insight so far <clears throat> is that I realized even before my name and who I was it's as if before identifying with a name as a child as through my earliest memory or it was as if I was identifying as as an unborn or how would I say it as a singular image it's as if my earliest memory is an image. And, w and when I wondered about, okay, what is behind this mem memory, it's as if when you get to the point <clears throat> where you have reached your earliest mem conscious memory in this lifetime, think of memories as also a domino, you know. Now we're wondering about the first domino that was like pushed the first moment of conscious reception where some sort of memory or inner uh, resemblance of the outer was taken, you know, was recorded. <coughs> Even a better metaphor is like our, our brains are like cameras, but the operator of the camera is inside the camera, experiences from inside the camera. Now, the earliest recording beyond that, there is no image. If there is desire, your imagination begins to add another dimension to all your memories, and then it accesses infinite, I would say, um, a creativity through chaos. You see, when you order reality in a certain way, we fixate its flow. 
you know, we solidify its flow. <clears throat> but when a person wonders about chaos, and when I say chaos, I'm using this word as a philosopher. I'm not using it as if you have cultural significance, if it has to mean evil, right? To me, it's as if there are moments that make sense and moments that don't. And they're sandwiched between one another. You know, and it's as if in one moment something makes sense, and then it's like you live a couple of days and you're like, no way, what was I thinking? <laughs> so to me, it's as if for the psychology, we are being teleporters and time travelers. That means it's as if, like, think about it, think about how, how advanced and sophisticated the brain is for a moment. Okay, so a person, let's say they're um, drinking coffee on a balcony, that's the memory in the present, and then they remember yesterday where they drank tea on the balcony, okay? <clears throat> now, what tends to happen is that a memory was infused with another level of memory, or how would I say it? It was as if one image, like, like uh, placing pieces of paper on top of each other, it's as if like in the middle of the present where a person's drinking coffee, they're remembering how tea tasted like. <laughs> it's pretty much like Tetris. That means that in the present, when a person remembers something or visualizes something, it's like a layer of reality has fallen on another layer of reality. <clears throat> For me, I went to a space beyond my earliest memory where I realized that it's as if energy and awareness being instantaneous and there is no changing truth after that when you realize that. This brings with it a sort of strange freedom. What is this freedom it brings? The freedom it brings is that the fear of identity is <coughs> disconnected. It's as if imagine saying all suffering is internal connection issues. <laughs> you know, in reality, we come to presence. As presence, it is so not humanized that one's view on their own psychology becomes like, it's, it's as if everything that was significant about one's subjective landscape, it shifts in a different way where for the first time you are outside of your own mind. You know, I wouldn't say a person is, has a free mind at this point <clears throat> because the true freedom of the mind means to be boundaryless. Uh, the body has boundaries, so as long as we have a boundary, I mean, what kind of free mind do we have, you know? <laughs> but in, in regards to beyond, sure, you know, it's like if from the scientific angle, they embrace theories of string theory where there's 10 to 11 dimensions to reality, but when it comes to looking at a physical body and wondering, okay, could there be dimensions of intelligence? Could it be that um, <coughs> it's as if what we see as the biological human being is like the flower and the roots of the flower that go into, into the soil and still exist is another way of saying that the human being has an energetic presence beyond the room of matter beyond the room of physicality, right? This is, of course, this talk I'm giving right now, it's significant to one's inner realm. To me, um, to do a studio, like a majority or pretty much all problems on this planet that human beings have with one another can be solved with the simple adoption and realization that uh, of the distinction between the inner realm and the outer realm. That means if uh, this is to me how my I function, like my psychology functions, but I, I'm sharing it in case others may want to <clears throat> check it out. But really what it is, 
is that um, in front of my eyes, the outer realm, in, behind my eyes, the inner realm. The outer realm is conditional to the laws of nature. The inner realm is conditional to the laws that the sense of self creates. If one goes to their earliest sense of sen self, they realize that the first memory of oneself was being watched, was being recorded from a place that was not a place. This is when you come to the true recognition that, okay, my whole life has been contained and confined by the knowledge that the past hammered into the future. But the unknown has been here. You know, I don't know how many people, uh, like right now on our planet, this is pretty much the whole issue with, you can say, um, um, <clears throat> the concepts of a patriarchy and the concept of a matriarchy, you know, the main issue of it is that in some sense traditional duality which was respected for its distinction is shifting and therefore an environment is arising where the human where human beings are realizing that they are generating and simulating their personality in the moment so because in different moments we have different feelings if a person wants to say that who they are is based on their uh, feeling then in every moment where they feel something it's as if like i identify as you know Person. And then it becomes, I identify as pure energy. Then becomes, I identify as an, you know, extraterrestrial. I identify as a planet. Do you see what I mean? It's like it's it's like if emotions dictate personality, um, uh, this becomes a confusing issue. <clears throat> but if there is this recognition that all phenomena is happening in the spotlight of some great stage. You know, it's as if uh, to be able to acknowledge that you are an unknown being. Do you see what I'm saying here? I'm saying that I'm this guy where he ran after knowledge to see its edge and realize that the edge of knowledge is how the edge of self was unknown from the beginning. So the issue is, is that when we can't accept that the unknown was in the room first, we try to play the game of holding shape. And when you try to hold shape in a certain, in, in a changing world, when I say hold shape, that's like another way you can see it is like those who believe that ideological landscape sur sur surpasses the significance of the mystery of the outer landscape. So the unknown presence of awareness is where I reached. Now, ever since that moment where I came to a contentment with, okay, it's an unknown attention navigating in a known world. Its actions define it in the outer realms, but in the inner realms, the awareness to the inner actions define it. You see, we have, we have from the beginning been a multidimensional being. But first, we were, uh, you can say, uh, enslaved by, the, by a singular perception. Then we were enslaved by a dualistic perception, which is our current era. Now, as I'm giving this talk, it's as if like we are on the edge. It's like we're reaching a point where it's going to become very civilization 1.0 is going to become very weird and there's going to be this space where people are like okay what world view do we head towards then you know and if this is where i have this really feel, feel i don't know how to say it it's like in my heart i feel that um uh, because we're all unknown from the beginning or before the beginning of reality that unknown it is familiar with how our known life will enter the unknown. So behind that single image where identity leans against is an awareness that was the space where freedom can happen. Do you know? It's as if internally freedom is just an instant acknowledgement. Externally you gotta live for it.
to simplify it for, let's say, a culture, for it to have cultural value, <clears throat> I guess we can look at it in this way. That I'm, it, it's as if one human being has noticed that the mystery of the source of energy being reality instantly is unknown. And if we identify with that as our true nature, it's as if, like, the emptiness has eyes, which what it sees give it shape, give it, give it its shape. Now, the implication of this for culture is as if, like, again, the roots of the human individual is, is, is in an inconceivable presence of a dimension. So that, that's the point where the species moves beyond duality. We, f we free ourselves from duality. Now, still, civilization needs to function. And this is where I would say the species has to quickly become one. Uh, this is my vision. I talk about it in this book. I mean, I'm writing it in a book, but I've talked about it in other talks. <clears throat> Pretty much what it is, is that, to me, world peace is an old school uh, view on efficiency. And in reality, peace is still part of dualism. So in, in some sense, what we need is that imagine a day comes that the leaders of all nations realize that it's just 8 billion creatures on a rock. There comes this as if all nations have the word SUB with a dash added in front of it, you know? And so there is, it's, it becomes as if, like, how would I say it? it um, if aliens come and say, where are you from or what's your country? We'll be like, hey, buddy, we're just a bunch of creatures on a rock. You know, we have the, in some sense, the final nation, you know, as if, you, as if it's like the finale. It's like the destiny of every nationalistic position is to not in some sense we all clone ourselves in a singular behavior but to create another level where it's all one you see we have uh, uh, the dimension of zero think of think of these four symbols zero one two infinity this is a system i've developed which i feel it it it, it completely covers every philosophical possibility void is here as human beings are here like the singular notion is how would I say it? it's as if like one world <clears throat> and then a self and a world pretty much think of it this way we experience space we experience singular object hood. We experience dualistic dimension hood. And now what's left is the infinite. Who knew the greatest world story was an infinite one? You know. And this view of an advanced civilization is for an infinite civilization. It is, it is as if we have cared for not the destiny of the individual, but the destiny of the collective. Like it's, it's one of the most honorable privileges for a human being. I feel any human being who has cared for, in some sense, the future of the future, it's as if uh, <clears throat> we're comrades on the same battlefield. Through this awareness that we are beyond subjects, society needs to restructure. We have to have multidimensional tolerance and in some sense be able to scan out efficient and inefficient systems. <clears throat> and the way we do that is there is a quote from the
sorry guys, this was on mute. <coughs> quote, um, if the last thing people heard uh, a quote from, uh, pretty much there's this quote from uh, Hagakura, the book of the samurai, and in the book, it, it's a quote where I've put it in the channel description, so anybody goes to the about section of the YouTube channel, you can find that quote at the end. <coughs> now, the quote says, respect, honesty, courage, rectitude, loyalty, honor, benevolence. That's pretty much it. And I was saying this thing that, okay, if we want to care, we wonder about the greatest advanced civilization, it would be as if a benevolent and the most incredible, efficient uh, continuity. You know, that is really it. <coughs> World peace is a snapshot. It's like a photo. But in reality, the maintenance of a civilization is like a film. And every generation casts an image upon the world, you know, and media uh, influences them. So pretty much to uh, tie all of what I'm saying together, <coughs> it's as if I, I wondered about uh, the origin of self. I realized that the, the person's identity or how they animate it's leaning against a world view an inner world view so when you reach that er, the earliest inner world view you reach a point where you notice you are and you are being an intelligence that is aware of the first memory before uh, uh, any other reference so it's as if every human being if they go back to the earliest memory of this conscious lifetime they notice that they were not a human watching their, themselves be a human. When I say not a human, I'm not talking about shape, I'm talking about space. <coughs> you realize you, were the, you are a space of life. And reality is taking place. So I feel, to simplify the algorithm from the quote, Whoever you are, wherever you are, just try it out at least for like a month and only make benevolent decisions. And now imagine this reaches a point where this benevolence doesn't mean the boredom of a, you know, inefficient utopia. Benevolence means that if the human biology is being wound, well it's as if it's total care, right? It's as if, you know, people care for uh, parts of the world, but they don't care for the whole world. If you were to care for the whole world, it means you're caring for the whole moment. So in some sense, it's another way of saying the whole, your whole world is in caring for uh, the actual whole world, you know? <laughs> So with this, uh, honestly, I feel like I've said most of what I can say for this topic. Really what it is, is we remember ourselves through an energetic uh, presence of being that is in nature unknown because the personality needs knowledge. The personality is knowledge in some sense. And so, with the insight of a multidimensional being, there comes the requirement for the adjust adjustment of all social systems for a multidimensional being. <clears throat> this may seem like it will make things complex, but it will bring forth a level of honesty and decency in civilization that a too soon judgment doesn't break reality. have officially reached that point in the progress of a species on a rock where the mind has uh, the intelligence of the mind has a capability 
to see multiple dimensions and in some sense a, 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 a hold reality as if every moment is its own room. This is very energy efficient, by the way. Right? If you have a singular expectation on the whole day, it's as if before you've lived the day, you've limited it. You know, but if the person treats every moment, you know, that means this is something strange that if, if life is too intense, what, what do, you know, what does the self-help, uh, self-help community suggest? In some sense, to slow it down to the degree that it's as if, if a person does a simple decision, okay, that wasn't too bad. But if a person thinks they have to make a complex decision all the time, then it's as if the dual, dualism of the mind goes into turbulence. For me, I, I want to I wanna see a species, a, an advanced civilization or a civilization where this civilization, every member of it acknowledges that there is an inner life and an outer life and that the inner life opens up to a sort of infinite multidimensionalism and the outer life requires to be in some sense return to the void, right? So it's as if it, it's like an argument for the... Um, efficiency equaling the greatest like compassion in the sense that we have no idea what the orchestra orchestrated potential of eight billion billion creatures on a rock would be like and that being multi-dimensional that means think of it this way that rather than everybody having a singular belief It's like we're all crew members of this giant spaceship. And we don't know where the spaceship is really heading, but we're inside the spaceship. And every human being, every entity that has a sort of separate uh, organism-based relationship with, with the planet, it's as if we're all crew members. And each crew member has a sort of role of their own capability. That means, imagine you are on the spaceship, and there's, you know, like the, the the alarm lights are going on, you know. And so, what you do is that you just go there. You don't know what the problem is, but you're like, how can I help? How can I help? Now, imagine eight billion human beings, right, with the, a sort of, uh, you know, an honorable and benevolent inner self. When I say honorable, you people don't realize this. Honor is an incredible source of strength, but it's accumulated strength in accordance to how, what type of memories you have created for your future self, you know? <clears throat> they don't say this, but there is an honor for life alone. That means it's like any living being that has managed to get here like it, it deserves like an you know what it is it's just like about eight billion creatures with incredible potential and their potential is not being actualized and they're all waiting for the whole thing to end you know it's as if like there's so many departments of an advanced civilization that need work it's like one would be like certain human beings going and trying to find a way that the energy issue of the human being is solved that means imagine you know all nations leaders of nations were like okay you know we want to have we see what the healthiest human body uh, or maintenance of the human body would be like do you know and so it would be a sort of task of trying to find the elixir uh, of immortality, the fountain of youth. You know, that's really anybody in the health industry, that's really, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Each member, on, as Buckminster Fuller and Marshall McLuhan would say, spaceship Earth, every member requires to play their part and recognize that the whole point of the crew is that if a certain crew is incapable other crew members can come right so it's another way of saying that we build an advanced civilization that's every human being starts taking care of the blind spots of our world, you know and we realize and all even you know let's say a, there, let's say there's people who are entertaining the evil archetype on the planet. It's as if you'll realize how much uh, 
a monetary value even there is in an efficient compassion civilization do you know like there is there's so many uh, factors to this that it's honestly like the whole species has to find you know uh, a, 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 a sit at the philosopher's table Last thing I'll say, and then uh, it, the chat section seems lively, so I'll open it up to Q and A about the talk. If anybody has a question, but the the final thing I'll say <clears throat> is that we open our eyes in a four point five billion year old science project. Regardless of inner images, images of suffering, it's as if it took us so long to have this this level of evolved capability. After one surpasses physical capability, it's as if imagine somehow you physically did every physical uh, uh, possibility uh, in reality. It's as if then you would be left with the mind. It's another view where when robots take all of our jobs, it's like mind work becomes greater than body work. You know? And just this ability to discriminate, there is an inner self inside a private server of the world and there is an outer self in a public server. Honestly, it's like the soul is a uh, is similar to like a gamer that's like sitting in front of a screen, right? And so the gamer is not made of pixels, but the character on the screen is made of pixels. It's as if our individual physical hood is similar, and the awareness that is being the whole moment that you can see the original presence of reality before worldhood, even before conception. It's as if in our inner realms, not only did we find freedom, but we found the ability that comes with freedom. <clears throat> in our inner realms, everybody should be living with the wonder of, okay, what would the most advanced, uh, uh, intelligent expression of uh, every moment I'm journeying in be like? Do you know? It's like, it, it's like, believe it or not, the spirit of advancement is starting to take steps on this reality you know it's like an advanced civilization poetically let's say it had a, a spirit and now every person alive right now it's as if they are held by that spirit it's another way of saying the spirit of the future gui guides the minds of the past It's a giant mystery. We're living in the pre-knowing what the mind actually is era. <laughs> there is a purity in caring for the future's greatness, not your own greatness, but the future's greatness, you know? An advanced civilization doesn't mean everybody's inner realm is going to be satisfied with it. An advanced civilization is like the outer realms has wondered about its greatest possibility. Right now, the civilization 1.0 is like the it's like how our ancestors left it for us. Do you know it's the best they could do, the best uh, you know ancients could do. <clears throat> but now that we are conscious of decision making. You know, 
there has to immediately come a global identity because there's so many levels beyond it that means imagine like you know in thousands of years from now there were sky cities and people were like oh my god i've been identifying as a person walk you know roaming the streets of mankind you know <clears throat> sitting in the offices of mankind not realizing that this whole time we are in a universal position so after one's identity with their culture and nation okay it's like why stop there now identify as it with as being part of the whole planet identify as being part of the galaxy <clears throat> identify as being a universal being do you know how rare that is you know how rare it is that an ego is is in some sense acknowledging the life of the universe prior to its uh self-selection and sculpting of what it finds to then choose to see <clears throat> so anyways that's it for the talk guys uh, my attention is coming to the chat section for a couple minutes if anybody wants me to explain something you can share <clears throat> but I think I, I you know usually I'm so so great <laughs> that uh, there's people don't have questions, you know, it's uh, like... <laughs>
<clears throat> in esoteric concepts, there's the or there's this notion of initiation and being reborn. But I will tell you, it's as if you realize you are unborn. Your awareness was in the in reality prior to how your body appeared in it. Right when you reach that point, then in some sense the ideological relationships, their significance is left to your choice. The idea is that you creatures that seek freedom, they should in some sense try to uh, wonder how they are not free first. You know, it's like the poet Rumi has this quote. Oh man, if I remember it correctly, he says, uh, "Your task is not to." search or seek for love it's one of those and he says your task is to get rid of all the barriers you have made against it and it's another way of saying we are being the most advanced presence of energy or we are being the most advanced moment of being right <clears throat> but in some sense the barriers that we make it create our identity now is it safe to is it something that it's as if if somebody says hey mr within would you recommend for someone to stay in samadhi 24 7 i would say conditional samadhi you can't stay in it in 24 7 and if you do it's a waste waste of like there's the you know it's as if rather than meditating in the caves to realize your mind in any moment whoever you are you can realize your mind is being in awareness right and when you realize you are that awareness it's as if you you reach the point where uh, the personality notices it was a mask for what the presence the soul even the word soul is unnecessary for it you know but you could I could say the inconceivable view But it is important to realize that these are different rooms and dimensions. So if a person identifies as a universal being, that's like a one level, think of it. Then if a person identifies as a cultural being, you know, it's like one level. <clears throat> if they identify as a galactic being, another level. These are levels to human psychology. Rather than us thinking that people's identity or the impression we get of people is just shackled to how we saw them. It's as if it's like this, uh, 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 in every moment's free will activity is like an invisible scanner of all the outer realm and <clears throat> inner realm possibilities and then an instant selection comes. To me, some people feel like when they the, when they think about the ego, they're like, "I want to destroy my ego." You know, <laughs> you know they make the ego, the ego, the Joker from Batman, and they want to just you know punch it in midnight. You know? <laughs> but what it is is that the ego is a technology. I feel rather than seeing evil, we're going to see misuse of attention or inefficiency it's as if every moment a person has a choice <clears throat> you know i was honestly very tired and i before giving this episode i'm like how am i gonna <laughs> how am i gonna do this what i but i just went with it and it's as if the ability to fathom that there are other possibilities um makes faith uh that makes faith uh, f-a-i-t-h makes faith worthy To me, every person, let's say you're someone, you hear these talks and uh, <clears throat> you wonder what you can do with hearing these talks, I'll tell you that um, <clears throat> to me, I would like to see a species that every individual human being becomes an explorer and realizes that they have eyes that others don't. To me, for a long time, I was looking at media and TV shows, and I was like, what is what is making me watch this TV show? And then I realized it is for, to, to discover the unknown. We are creatures that it's as if we just want to see change before it changes, right? It's as if there's a sort of urge in human psychology. It wants
wants to, just like it wants to eat food, it wants to consume information. But people don't realize that the way you look at information becomes how you are in a formation. It, be, it shapes you. <clears throat> that means what, if a person just thinks they're a thought, it's as if you're being shaped by every moment. You know, it's as if, it's, it's as if uh, gullible, gullibility to the power of infinity. <laughs> You know, if the person doesn't realize that it's as if they, they are not a thought. It's so ridiculous. It does, you know, I'm telling you, this whole time that we've, human beings have been thinking their thoughts, it doesn't make sense. You know, a thought is thinking it's being a thought. You know, it's like, no. <laughs> You know, we need explorers and uh, we need pretty much every dimension of civilization or whoever's in any position in civilization to wonder how you can advance it. You could be a chef and you can wonder how you can advance whatever you're doing. You know, you could, you could be an architect and wonder what the most advanced buildings look like. And you know what it is? People... Um, or I would say what I have noticed as well, what most people in the New Age community do <clears throat> is that their past creates suffering for them. For them. They realize if they are just pre uh, present, the past is not them, right? And then the suffering goes away. But the species is not being motivated, is not being inspired to wonder what if our vision for the future is the greatest uh, counter-attack to our suffering. Do you see what, what I like to see, really, is that uh, the roar of mankind. That's one thing I would like to see before I exit this dimension. To just see what it would look like, you know, if there was an effort, think of it this way, an advanced civilization, people are going to be like, Mr. Within, that's so far away, you know. <laughs> and I'll say, okay, yeah, that's far away. But to see how an advanced civilization starts, that's not far away. We're all in that point. You see, there is a saying which mystics back in the day would say, the mind is a lousy master, but it is a great servant. And it's another way of saying that, and there's, let's, I remember hearing this quote, I don't know who said it, but somebody said, <clears throat> I think it was a military quote, it was like, you must serve before you can command. And if you take, connect these two ideas and for a moment wonder about the intent of the relationship of a human with their own mind. It's as if you need to serve and trust your own intelligence, how you are being. And if you have lived through that trust, then you will start trusting the outer realms. But if a person doesn't have trust even when they close their eyes, it's as if you are lost before you could be found. You know, it's like you have to, it, it's like we choose what room we stay in. Sometimes human beings may not have a choice how they look at the moment because they were conditioned and raised in a certain way. But at the same time, you have a choice of where you stay. That means if you had a bad past, it's as if you, it's like you choose to have that relationship in, in a moment where that past has passed, you know. <clears throat> Honestly, what else can I say? Like, I'm, I, it's like, what else can a creature on a rock in the middle of nowhere say? Let's see what the greatest thing we can do in the outer realms, and let's see what is our greatest finding of the inner realm. The whole species starts this some giant project, okay, where every human being is honestly, and through that quote of the Hagakura I read earlier, <clears throat> honestly, Every person begins documenting how their inner realms is happening, how their minds is, is happening. They begin to, in some sense, when I say serve your mind, I don't mean listen to some invisible voice. I mean watch your moment and walk with it. Try.
try to understand prior to expectation and you will realize the incredible intelligence the human being has. You know, um, I would say in fascination there is actually no questions. It's an incredible just possibility that we are human beings that can communicate and think about it. Like it's the most obvious clue, you know, why I keep saying like uh, in other talks I've talked about advanced communicators, that they, they will in some sense advanced communicators and pilots of consciousness. The advanced communicators are taking care of in some sense the outer reality and the pilots of consciousness are taking care of the inner reality of the whole species you know the issue is not to accept the less you know uh, the comfortable less but to accept the uncomfortable more what I mean by this is that it takes, it's like a choice of energy. Like it takes the same energy to fathom a failing universe. And it takes the same amount of energy to fathom a successful universe. And a successful universe means every moment of the universe is actualizing its most efficient effect. You see, it's, it's, it's not just about we, that human beings were alive. It's also about how human beings walked the earth. And that's what leads towards an advanced civilization. There's so many dimensions of life not documented. There is so many words that will in the future be in the dictionary that have not been unraveled yet, like jewels in, in the dirt, you know? So my whole point is, wonder about your most advanced self, you'll automatically realize and wonder about the most advanced world. And once you wonder about the most advanced world, all that is left is how a, a, a sort of uh, present self identifies with the unknown uh, factors of nature. You see, I'm a person who, in my youth, I was, I think this was a sort of inner blessing where I had an, uh, my eyes saw uh, metaphors, great metaphors for honor. Do you know? And it was as if I remember I had seen, what do you call it? Um, the movie Gladiator. <laughs> and I was young, and I remember just for a second, like my mind ignoring all the violence and realizing that those who are honest to their moment winds of evolution honor you. You see, it's an archetypal position. Right now, me saying, hey guys, on this, you know, podcast you're called Mr. With, and that's just archetypal position. <laughs> but what we are is so beyond. You know, that, you know, all I'm expecting is that the future generations will hear my talks, hopefully, and they will in some sense see the blind spots that I try to uh, see. Because I am telling you, if I was to identify as my mind, um, the type of being I have been behind my eyes to myself is Having gone through certain revolutions, internal revolutions of like, like I've had so many moments where I experienced something and it just revolutionized my thinking because the old, it's as if the falsehood had faded for a second. To me, the whole idea is we reach as far as we can and then we pass the torch. 
approach to this next future generations in anything. That's how advancement happens. That means imagine you were like somebody washing dishes, and for a moment you just think, what would the most greatest <laughs> person washing dishes and how would they live in that? How would they do it? Do you know? It could be the same for anything. It's just honor gives us free energy because we care for what we do. You know. But if a person, let's say they 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 are shackled uh, by uh, ig by ignorant decisions to be defined as having a certain nature, like I'm I'm going to tell you, like even though I'm talking about an advanced civilization, which is very in the future, right now in the present, we are not that evolved as a species. Like violence still exists as a concept. You know, rather than recognizing, treating the planet as if we're 8 billion passengers. We're 8 billion travelers of a world. Every day I wake up, it's as if like, you know, it, it's, it's as if I've, uh, you know, rented a, another moment on Earth before I get tired and return to the unknown. means it's like there's something beyond something more than just being a good human being to be an advanced human being and to in some sense be at the frontiers of novelty in any dimension of your uh, life's art form you know every person has access to a rhythm that means it's as if we're antennas and every antenna can pick up signals very differently in accordance to, let's say, their, how their ancestors bestowed their consciousness, uh, unconditional consciousness, a sort of genetical gift. What I mean by that is that the fact that we are conscious and aware of the world is one of the most advanced things that could be happening in nature right now. To me, it's it's like the concept of a mind is mind blowing. <laughs> <laughs> like just take it in. We're multidimensional beings this whole time, and we have been identifying with certain dimensions. And suffering has shackled us to just the outcome of one view. You know, in the future, meditation is going to become very advanced. You know, when I said what I mean by this is that there is an approach. That it's as if, like, imagine some uh, some per some horrible event happens in nature, or some great event happens in nature, an event of great energetic intensity, right? And imagine the children of that advanced civilization, every they can just sit down, close their eyes, and for a second just watch the presence of the realm, the presence of the world, and instantly know what that event was, right? You see, it's like first you gotta feel comfortable on the chair, you know, then you gotta feel comfortable with the table, then you pick up the pen, then you stare at the empty page, and only when you, in your inner realms, notice something that is to your own past supreme, it's as if you'll realize it, the, the fastest thing that turns a person into a writer is the importance of what they want to communicate and the context they choose to have in it. You see, it, it's as if, um, to me, it's, um, I have an incredible, like, if somebody's like, hey, Mr. Within, how would, how would you explain like the most spiritual experiences you've had on this planet? I would say it would be through writing and communication. Those are those have been my most ex spiritual experiences. In writing, I have written as a personality, and I have watched the moment move the moment. Do you know? I have been an observer, just the same way we don't think about our heart. It just beats. A person's writing can reach a level where they don't have to even think. It's as if they're just watching an inner film, and the whole body and brain already knows how to do everything. It's just that the moment the made-up mind projects strength, so what it is is that the moment a person decides from a state of honesty, which means pure simplicity, 
That means when your most purest and simplest self observes nature, it's, I can tell you, honesty is a GPS to uh, the efficient maneuvering in a changing world. Like there's something about it, you know. spiritual people having a t uh, talking and the first spiritual person spiritual person A <laughs> goes to spiritual person B and says oh, I talk to my spirit God you know and sorry guys just a second Anyways, person, uh, the example I want to say is that the person says, I spoke to my spirit guide, to the other person. The other person says, what did your spirit guide said, uh, say? And how did your spirit guide look like? And the person said that the spirit guide was inconceivable, and it said, in some sense, that... How would I say it? Let's say the person's spirit guide tells them that who, what the spirit guide is is inconceivable and who is looking for the spirit guide is inconceivable. It all leads to an unconditional faith. Like of, of the present moment. Literally, we're left to either trust how this world will happen or distrust it. If we distrust it, if a person distrusts their civilization, regardless of how inefficient it's being, let's say you're like, okay, what kind of civilization this is? So it's like, do human beings deserve even an advanced civilization? And if you just see the potential of an advanced civilization, it justifies everybody's like ability. society, imagine all of them suddenly deciding full on to just wonder about how they can contribute to an advanced civilization. Imagine all nations having a strangely strange camaraderie, okay? Imagine all the le world leaders, you know, and they are for a moment like for the sake of an advanced civilization we have instantaneous allegiance and we get our smartest people to in some sense wonder about what what sort of economical relationship countries need to have with one another do you know there can be even this notion that we can have presidents of sectors of reality rather than just the president you know of of one whole territory but these are all how the future unravels you know nature eventually makes its decisions so with the inner attitude of being an advanced being and an advanced being wondering about its most advanced state and then wondering about its most advanced collective state we stare at you know we stand our ground as time like a con conqueror approaches us you see it's like this reality is fascinating anyways 
gonna end this episode so this character in the wallpaper can, you know, uh, travel to the other side of the bridge. <laughs> Imagine this is a video and that character on the bridge is just like listening to my talk this whole time. You know? <laughs> Reality and the inner realms are, it's like the era of the multidimensional entity has begun. Thanks for listening, guys. This was a long one.